Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good day everyone. Uh, welcome to the June chapter meeting for CSI Next. Uh, this will be our final meeting of the year for CSI and we'll start anew uh, in uh, September. Uh, I am Mark Ogg, currently your, your chapter president. Uh, today uh, we're completing our monthly line monthly lineup of uh, programs for you and as always a huge thank you goes out to our uh, continued chapter sponsors uh, for all their involvement and and uh, continued support uh, Bear Corporation uh, Allegion who is our presenter today uh, National Gypsum and uh, Accu Studio your continued support is valued and very very much appreciated uh, by all of the chapter members um, all of our chapter sponsors web links are on CSI next on the website uh, so be sure to check those people out and today we have with us uh, Leslie Leslie Medina from Allegion uh, she will be presenting on ADA compliant hardware if at any time during the presentation you have a question, <clears throat> just raise your hand in the uh, GoToWebinar app there on your computer screen, uh, and uh, we will get to them as soon as we can. Uh, so with that, uh, I will turn it over to Leslie, and um, we'll get started. So uh, Leslie, uh, it's all yours. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining in today. Um, we have just a couple mandatory slides here at the beginning. Okay, go on over the copywritten materials. So hello and welcome. Um, this is a presentation on ADA compliance as it relates to finished hardware. I am Leslie Medina. I am a hardware specification consultant with Allegiant, and my office is based out of Dallas, Texas. So if you hear a little accent, maybe that's what it is. Today, I want to share with you my love for finished hardware, and my hope is that you too will have your eyes open to the wonders of door hardware, and especially how it relates to ADA compliance. So without further ado, let's get started. The objective for this presentation is that upon successful completion of this course, the participants, which is all of you on the line, should be able to, according to the ADA, define hardware requirements and identify opening and closing forces of accessible openings and determine opening dimensions and clearances needed for accessible openings and to know where to look when specifying ADA compliant hardware solutions for your projects. We will be covering the requirements for accessible openings according to the ADA, which is a federal law and applies to many buildings throughout the US. Some states and local jurisdictions also adopt accessibility standards, so it's important to be aware of all the requirements that may affect a particular project. Current building codes require most doors to be compliant with the accessibility standards. There are specific exemptions in the IBC and in the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design, but the locations are not required, that are not required to be accessible are very limited. For jurisdictions where the IBC has been adopted, reference standards for accessibility is the ICC A117.1, Accessible and Usable Buildings and Facilities. When referring to the accessibility standards, Please note that there are separate sections of Chapter 4 that apply to manual doors and automatic doors, which we will touch on later. Some requirements apply to both manual and automatic doors, but others only apply to one type. We will discuss which specific section will be needed to refer to later, depending on whether the door in question are automatic or manual. The first thing you need to know when trying to get an answer to a code question is where do you look? Which code has been adopted in the area where the project is located or if it's an existing building, which code was used when the building was built? So that is where you need to start. I'm going to talk about several different publications today, mainly focusing on the 2017 and 2009 ANSI ICC A117.1 and the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. Let's talk a little bit about the model codes and standards and define some of the acronyms that are gonna come up in this presentation. 
The ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, which became a law in 1990. The ADA is a civil rights law which prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. This includes jobs and schools, transportation, and all private and public places that are open to the general public. The purpose of the law is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. The ADA gives civil rights protection to individuals with disabilities similar to those provided to individuals on the basis of race, color, sex, national origin, age, and religion. In summary, the ADA guarantees equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities and public accommodations, employment, transportation, state and local government services, and telecommunications. So what is the IBC? That is the International Building Code. It's the most widely adopted building code in the United States. The International Code Council, also referred to as the ICC, is a membership association dedicated to building safety and fire prevention, which develops the IBC and other international codes. When referenced in local, state, and federal legislation, the IBC becomes the minimum requirement for construction. It's important to keep in mind that these are just the minimum requirements. A jurisdiction either uses the code as is or amends it to fit specific needs for the community. The ICC is committed to meeting and exceeding the accessibility requirements of the ADA and the Fair Housing Act, which is also called the FHA. Accessibility requirements are incorporated into the international codes as the codes are updated through the international code development process. So what is the ICC ANC A117.1? The ICC is the International Code Council and ANSI is the National American National Standards Institute. ANSI is the primary organization for fostering the development of technology standards in the United States. ANSI works with industry groups and is the US member of the International Organization of Standardization, also known as the ISO, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC. The ICC ANSI A117.1, Accessible and Usable Buildings and Facilities, is a nationally recognized standard of technical requirements for making buildings accessible. It was published in 1961 and is referenced by many federal documents and state accessibility laws. The IBC also references the ICC ANSI A117.1, which is developed through a public hearing and consistent process supervised by ANSI. So why do we use the IBC for accessibility? The Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, or ADAG, and the Fair Housing Accessibility Guidelines, as federal guidelines, must go through rulemaking process, which is a need when it needs to be amended or updated. The process can take a long time. The IBC has been revised on a three-year cycle since 2000. The ICC uses open hearing consistent process to develop its building safety and fire prevention codes, codes including the IBC. It is an inclusive process which allows input from all individuals and groups, including federal agencies and disability advocacy groups. Each cycle includes the opportunity for public comments. Final decisions are made by ICC voting members, code enforcement and fire officials who, with no vested interest beyond public safety, represent the public's best interest. This process allows for new ideas, techniques, and products to be incorporated in the requirements. And finally, let's discuss the role of the AHJ, which is the authority having jurisdiction. They play a crucial role in ensuring fire and life safety in buildings, and it's essential for facility managers to understand what the AHJ is and the role it plays throughout the life of a building. The first thing to understand, or for some of us to remember, is that the AHJ is not a single entity, necessarily. Depending on the jurisdiction your facility is in, the type of facility you're in, and who owns the facility, it may be visited not only by the fire marshal, but by a variety of individuals referred to as the authority having jurisdiction. 
who come into the premise to look at how well or how poorly your fire, life, and electrical safety programs are doing. The NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association codes, define the AHJ as an organization, office, or individual responsible for enforcing the requirements of a code or standard or for approving equipment, materials, an installation, or a procedure. This definition is also elaborated on in the annex of the codes, a portion of which states, where public safety is primary, the HJ may be a federal, state, local, or other regional department or individual, such as a fire chief, the fire marshal, chief of fire prevention bureau, laborer department, or health department, building official, electrical inspector, or others having statutory authority. For insurance purposes, the insurance inspection department, rating bureau, or other insurance company representative may be an AHJ. One last thought to keep in mind, although most codes and standards are revised every three years, the newest edition may not be adopted in the project's jurisdiction right away. The building code that's in effect when the building permit is issued is typically the code used during design and construction. The IBC has been adopted by many U.S. states, but states will often modify the IBC and add state-specific requirements. So it's important to be familiar with those modifications. To find out what code or local amendments are enforced in your area, contact your local building department. Now let's move on to our first objective. When designing a building with ADA compliance in mind, four key topics must be incorporated. First things first, getting to the building starts in the parking lot and leads all the way into and throughout the building. Getting into the building covers the potential obstacles that are presented at the building entrance, such as the doors, the hardware, the threshold, and the force it takes to open the doors. For a disabled person to move around inside the building, you need to design accessible paths for them once they gain access into the building. Using elements in the building is another important issue to think about. For example, are there accessible restrooms? Are there options other than stairs to move to multiple levels? Can the phone be accessed, the water fountains, the toilet? Doors and door hardware are an important part of the accessibility of buildings. For today's presentation, we're gonna focus on aspects that affect getting in the building, and moving around inside the building as they pertain to doors and door hardware. One requirement for ADA compliance for door hardware has to do with how a person can get into the building and into doors within the building. In the 2017 ICC A117.1 section 404.2.6 states, handles, pulls, latches, locks, and other operable parts of the door and gate shall have the shape that's easy to grasp with one hand and does not require tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist to operate. The operational force to retract latches or disengage devices that hold the door or gate in a closed position shall be as follows. Door hardware operated by a forward pushing or pulling motion can have 15 pounds maximum pressure. Hardware operated by rotational motion is 28 pounds maximum. And the 2010 ADA section 404.2.7 under door and gate hardware, it states the following. Handles, poles, latches, locks, and other operable parts of doors and gates shall comply with 309.4. You might be asking yourself, what is 309.4? It discusses operation. It says that operable parts shall be operable with one hand and shall not require tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist. The force required to activate operable parts shall be five pounds maximum. The exception is gas pumps. The nozzles shall not be required to provide operable parts that have activating force of five pounds maximum. When you think about ADA compliance solutions, keep in mind that door hardware can be operated with a, that can be operated with a closed fist. For example, when operating a lever or push bar or a loose grip, for example, when operating pull handle accommodates the greatest range of users. Hardware that requires simultaneous hand and finger movements require greater dexterity and coordination and are not generally recommended. 
Hardware used to operate doors, including handles, poles, latches, and locks, must have a shape that's easy to grasp with one hand. It does not require the tight grasping or pinching or twisting of the wrist to operate. So that would mean no round knobs. Let's move on to door pulls. The online ADA guide published by the Access Board in 2015 states that door pulls should have a one and a half inches of clearance behind them. This dimension is not stated in the standards with regard to door pulls, but is the required clearance for handrails. Code officials have questioned the use of pulls when a person's hand cannot slide through, so it's best to use an open pull to avoid problems. As it mentions on the slide, the projection of a pull is not specified by ADA or A117.1, but the pull should be open so the hand can slide through. Is the pretzel pole shown on the right ADA compliant? It's hard to tell, but it sure does look delicious. A final call would be up to the HJ. Please note that even lever handles may have some requirements in various jurisdictions. Lever operated mechanisms, push type mechanisms, and U-shaped handles are acceptable designs. You might be asking, is it okay to use a deadbolt with a thumb turn on a door that's required to be accessible? The accessibility standards don't specify a certain dimension that would be accessible on a thumb turn. The ADA guidelines and ICC A117.1 both state that hardware has to be operable without tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist, but that still leaves a lot up to interpretation. In my opinion, there are thumb turns that can be operated by someone with a disability as long as the hardware is installed correctly, since incorrect installation can cause binding and make the thumb turn difficult to turn. If you can operate the thumb turn with the side of your palm without grasping it with your fingers, I think it would be considered accessible. I've heard of code officials using the temp of a pencil to test the accessibility operation of a thumb turn. Many thumb turns are now designed so that they pivot on the end rather than the center, requiring less leverage to operate. The lock would also need to be mounted within the allowable range for operable hardware, typically 34 to 48 inches above the floor, and it would have to have only lock on the door to meet the requirement that the door unlatch with one operation. If the door was fire rated, the deadbolt would not provide the necessary positive latching, so the lock set or fire rated exit hardware with an active latch bolt would be required for that application. Pictured on the bottom of the screen are some thumb turns that would likely be considered accessible should they be installed correctly. Sliding doors. The 2010 ADA guidelines states, where sliding doors are in the fully open position, operable hardware shall be exposed and usable from both sides. If you decide to use a pocket door on an opening that's required to be accessible, here's what you need to know. The hardware has to be exposed and usable from both sides when the door is fully open. Flush pulls and edge pulls are not considered usable for somebody with a disability, so surface mounted door pulls must be used. These surface mounted pulls will prevent the door from sliding fully into the pocket, so the minimum clear width of 32 inches must be maintained between the edge of the door in its slightly open position and the opposite jam. Now is the time in the presentation where we are going to identify the opening and closing forces of accessible openings according to the ADA. Two very common accessibility issues for door openings can usually be addressed by making simple adjustments. The accessibility standards require accessible doors to be open with a limited amount of opening force and to close slowly. Often these requirements can be met by properly adjusting the spring power and the valves of the door closer. Let's take a look at the opening force, force requirements first. The opening force requirements are the same for both the 2009 edition of the ICC A117.1, Accessible and Usable Building and Facilities, Section 404.2.8, and the 2010 American with Disabilities Act standard section 404.2.9. The maximum opening force, force for an interior hinge door is five pounds. The maximum opening force for a sliding or folding door is also five pounds. 
Both standards note that the five pound force limitation does not apply to the force required to retract the latch bolts or disengage other devices that hold the door in a closed position. In earlier editions of the standards, the opening force for exterior doors was addressed, but the current ASET 117.1 and ADA standards do not include opening force requirements for our exterior doors. The opening force limitation may be addressed in local codes with some local requirements ranging from 15 pounds to 5 pounds for our exterior doors. When local codes do not address opening force, the limit states in the adopted building codes, those typically apply. The difficulty with exterior doors is that adjusting the door to low opening force and consequently a low opening force will sometimes result in an exterior door that is unable to close properly. Wind, air pressure, weather strip, latch bolts, and other conditions contribute to this problem. Check with your local code to determine opening force requirements for exterior doors. Fire rated doors are exempt from the five pound force limitation in the accessibility standards and are subject to a minimum opening force allowable by the appropriate administrative authority. Although some states and local jurisdictions have adopted maximum opening force limits for these doors. For example, in California, a five pound limit for interior doors applies to swinging and exterior doors as well, when there are no automatic operators in the vicinity. Although NFPA 80, the standard for fire door and other opening protectives does not include the requirements for the amount of force used to open or close a fire door, Annex A of NFPA 80 does address the need for adequate spring power to ensure that the door is closed and latched, while taking into consideration the potential difficulty of opening a fire door. Annex A recommends a size three closer or an interior three foot wide fire door and a size four closer for exterior fire doors. Wider doors or doors with abnormal, abnormal air pressure and other circumstances may require an increase to the next spring size. The closer size is referred to as a spring power, which correlates with opening and closing force. While fire doors are not required to open with five pounds of force, the maximum force on all egress doors, including fire doors, is addressed in the IBC. The maximum allowable force is 15 pounds to release the latch and 30 pounds to set the door in motion and 15 pounds to swing the door to the full open position. Power operated doors are subject to the same requirements except that the maximum force to set the door in motion is 50 pounds. However, the BHMA standards for automatic doors impose a more restrictive limit. The picture on the right shows you the measuring points for gauging the opening force. On the left, you can see what a force gauge looks like. How forces are measured. Forces for pushing or pulling doors open are measured with a push-pull scale under the following conditions. For hinged doors, the force is applied perpendicular to the door at the door opener or 30 inches from the hinge side, whichever is further from the hinge. For sliding or for folding doors, the force is applied parallel to the door at the door pole or latch. Application of force, you apply force gradually so that the applied force does not exceed the resistance of the door. In high-rise buildings, Air pressure differentials may require modifications to, of the specification in order to meet the functional intent. The accessibility standards do not go into detail about how to measure the opening force or closing speeds, but there are recommended, recommended methods, including the ANSI BHMA A156.4 from 2013, the ANSI standard for door controls and closers. The recommended method for measuring force compliant to the ADA states, on the push side of the door, locate the point on the horizontal center line of the push plate or lock trim at one inch from the latch edge of the door. 
Mark the floor at a point where the push side of the door's latch style is at 70 degrees. Mark a second point where the push side is three inches from the latch. Open the door so that the latch is clear of the strike and the door is slightly off the stop. Using the force gauge on the mark determined on step one, gradually push the door open to the 70 degree mark established on step two. Observe the maximum force reading. The recommended method for measuring closing time compliance states, on the push side of the door, locate a point on the center line of the push plate or lock trim or at 30 inches from the hinged edge of the door, whichever is greater. Mark the floor at the point 30 inches from the hinge pivot when the door is open to the 12 degree position and another at, on the same side of the door when the door is at the 90 degree position. Hold the door at the 90 degree mark, release the door and time the closing sweep between the two marks. The closing speed of an accessible door is addressed in section 404.2.7 of the 2009 edition of A117.1 and section 404.2.8 of the 2010 ADA standards. It states, Door closers and gate closers shall be adjusted so that from an open position of 90 degrees, the time required to move the door to a position of 12 degrees from the latch is five seconds minimum. Again, this requirement can easily be met by adjusting the closer. This time by limiting the flow of fluid via the adjustment valves and slowing the closing speed. At one time, a common practice was to equip accessible doors with delayed action closers, which delay the closing cycle for one to two minutes when open to the fully open position. While there may be some doors which the delayed action closers would be a good application, they are not required by accessibility standards and can even hinder the operation of some doors. The closing speed for spring hinges is also addressed in the accessibility standards. It states, Door and gate spring hinges shall be adjusted so that from the open position of 70 degrees, the door or gate shall move to the closed position in 1.5 seconds minimum. Although spring hinges are not prohibited by accessibility standards, their use on accessible doors should be carefully considered as they do not truly control the door. If spring hinges are used on fire doors, Annex A of NFPA 80 recommends that spring hinges should be adjusted to achieve positive latching when allowed to close freely from an open position of 30 degrees. When a door closer cannot be adjusted to meet accessibility requirements for opening force and closing speed, a good option is to install an automatic operator. The 2009 edition of A117.1 and the 2010 ADA standards do not require the installation of automatic operators on accessible doors per se although there are some state codes that do require them in certain circumstances. Most door closers sold today are capable of being adjusted for use on accessible door or on a fire door, but in situations where a door closer will not properly control the door within the limitations of the accessibility standards, an automatic operator should be considered. So what does the code have to say about door closers? The door closer shall be adjusted from the open position of 90 degrees. The time required to move the door to an open position of 12 degrees shall be five seconds minimum. For spring hinges, the code says that spring hinges shall be adjusted from an open position of 70 degrees. The door shall move to the closed position in 1.5 seconds. Um, if the door has a closer, then the sweep period of the closer shall be adjusted so that the open position of 70 degrees, the door will take at least three seconds to move to point three inches from the latch measured to the leading edge of the door. The picture shows how the fluid valves and fluid canals interact with the spring to control the door. Most closers are adjustable in size, meaning that the spring power can be increased or reduced to control the closing force, which also affects opening force. Closers that are not adjustable must be ordered in the correct size for the door opening, depending on the door size, 
whether the door is interior or exterior, or whether the location is subject to wind or air pressure. It's sometimes difficult to properly coordinate the functional requirements of a size closer with the opening force requirements for accessibility. The door closer can be adjusted by using the valves that limit the flow of fluid inside the closer. A little bit more on spring hinges. Um, according to the accessibility standards, they are allowed on doors in the accessible route, but as we said, they do not control the door and may be difficult for somebody with a disability because of the speed at which they close the door. Sometimes in the industry, you hear spring hinges be called cat killers, which is not a very kind term, but it does quite vividly depict how a spring closer cannot be fully adjusted, thus closing anything in the way, including perhaps your cat. Um, the spring hinges do have a 1.5 second minimum close speed instead of the five seconds that a normal door closer would have. But it kind of makes you think, what would somebody with a disability, how would it make them move faster, per se, just because of spring hinges on the door? As we mentioned, um, delayed action closers delay the closing action from a maximum degree of opening the door from 75 degrees. Delayed action can be from 10 to 20 seconds, depending on the governing codes. This benefit is for the physically impaired, elderly, or children. It's acceptable on fire rated doors if adjusted to 10 second maximum open time. Let's move on to determining opening dimensions and the clearances that are needed for accessibilities. There used to be a lot of confusion on how to measure a clear opening width of doors. The code and standards weren't specific, so on doors with panic hardware, code officials were taking the projection of the hardware into account when measuring the clear width. The codes and standards now clearly state the limitations of projections and that the measurement is taken on the face of the door, not of the hardware. The requirements are found in the IDC, the International Fire Code, Accessible and Usable Buildings and Facilities, and the 2010 ADA standards and NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code. Note the minimum clear opening width does not apply only to doors on the accessible route, but also doors in the means of egress. Clear width. Doors on an accessible route and doors in the means of egress are required to provide at least 32 inches of clear opening width. With the door open to 90 degrees, the clear opening width is measured on the face of the door and the stop on the strike jam of the frame. In many cases, swing clear hinges are used to increase the clear opening width by re relocating the 90 degree position of the door. Clear width for pairs of doors. On pairs of doors with at least, at least one leaf must provide 32 inches of clear opening width minimum measured from the face of the active leaf in the 90 degree position to the edge of the other leaf in the closed position or to the mullion. When replacing an existing pair of 30 inch doors, an unequal leaf pair is usually required. For pairs of automatic doors, the accessibility standards allow for full width of the opening, the so clear width of all leaves in the open position to be taken into account when measuring the clear opening width. Adding automatic operators may be an acceptable way to resolve clear width problems on existing doors. Note that the IBC requires one leaf of a pair to provide 32 inches clear width and does not differentiate between manually operated and automatic doors with regard to clear opening width. Sliding and folding doors in most locations must also provide at least 32 inches of clear opening width. Accessibility standards require sliding doors, including pocket doors, to have surface mounted hardware. This hardware may prevent the door from sliding fully open, which would also affect the clear opening width. Openings with or without doors, which are more than 24 inches deep, must provide a clear opening width of at least 36 inches, which you can see on the photo on the right. Note that some occupancy types require a greater clear opening width. For example, a hospital door used for the movement of beds would require to provide at least 41 and a half inches of clear opening width to fit the beds in and out of the opening. 
The IBC and the IFC limit the maximum width of an egress door to 48 inches. This dimension is not the maximum clear opening width, but the maximum door size. So again, that is 48 inches maximum. This maximum dimension has been removed from the recent editions of NFPA 101. There are exceptions within the code for some applications. For example, the IBC includes exceptions related to some doors in residential occupancies, group I3, sleeping rooms, small storage closets, and revolving doors. Let's talk a little bit about projections. No projections are allowed into the required clear opening width between the floor and a point 34 inches above the floor. This does not necessarily mean that nothing can project off the door. It means that nothing can project into the 32 inches required clear width dimension. Note that manual doors on an accessible route are not allowed to have any projections on the bottom 10 inches of the door height. Projections into the required clear opening width up to four inches are allowed between 34 and 80 inches above the floor. Since operating hardware is required to be mounted between 34 inches and 48 inches above the floor, hardware is not taken into account unless it projects more than four inches into the required 32 inch clear opening. Note that NFPA 101 limits these four inch projections to the hinge side of the opening between 34 inches and 48 inches above the floor, solely for the purpose of accommodating panic hardware or fire exit hardware. Projections into the clear opening width above 80 inches are not typically limited. Now let's talk about the minimum clear opening height. The codes and standards also include a requirement for the minimum clear opening height. The minimum headroom required is typically 80 inches nominal above the floor, which an allowance for a projection of the stop of the, the frame head. Most publications have an exception for the door closer arm or overhead stop arm, which is allowed to project down into the required headroom as long as a dimension of 78 inches of headroom is maintained. Other projections such as electromagnetic locks are not currently addressed in the codes and standards. There are some exceptions to the requirements for the 32 inch clear opening width and the 80 inch clear opening height, but typically these are the dimensions to keep in mind when specifying or supplying doors and hardwares on an accessible route or means of egress. Again, and as always, consult, consult the applicable codes for exceptions. Let's talk a little bit about hardware height. The 2017 ICC A117.1 section 404.6.2.6.1 talks about hardware height. Operable parts of hardware shall be 34 inches minimum and 48 inches maximum above the floor. When sliding doors are in the fully open position, operable hardware shall be exposed and usable from both sides. Each of the codes and standards that we typically refer to for the requirements pertaining to door openings contain slightly different language regarding mounting heights of operable hardware. So it's important to understand how the standards differ in order to fine tune the requirements for a specific project, for a specific project, depending on the code or standard in use. As I mentioned, the IBC requires operable hardware for most egress doors to be mounted 34 to 40 inches above finished floor, which you also see called AFF. Locks for security purposes. Locks used only for security purposes and not for normal operation are excluded and are permitted at any height. Beginning in the 2006 edition, there are exceptions for doors and gates leading to swimming for pools, spas, and hot tubs. This exception the release device for operable hardware may be mounted 54 inches maximum above the finished floor or ground. It's important to note that the language pertaining to locks only used for security purposes isn't very specific, and it leaves a lot up to interpretation of the AHJ. The IBC commentary gives an example of an unframed glass door at the front of a tenant space in a mall with a lock on the bottom rail. Deadbolts mounted 
at any other height may be accepted by the AHJ, depending on the occupancy type. Locks for existing doors. The ADA attempts to clearly define locations where existing doors may have hardware mounted outside of the 34 to 40 inch range. Existing locks shall be permitted at any location at existing glazed doors without styles, existing overhead rolling doors or grills, and similar existing doors or grills that are designed with locks that are activated only at the top or bottom rail. NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code, requires the releasing mechanism for any latch other than existing installations to be located between 34 and 48 inches AFF. When an existing security device is allowed on individual living units and guest rooms of residential occupancies, the device must be located no more than 60 inches above finished floor. Existing panic hardware may be mounted between 30 and 40 inches AFF, and the releasing mechanism for other latching hardware may be mounted below 48 inches AFF. The low limit for existing hardware is not specifically called out in the newer editions of NFPA 101 and older editions of AED NFPA 101 only include a maximum mounting height of 40 inches AFF as well. So how low can hardware be mounted? The 2010 ADA standards include an important change relative to the mounting height of hardware. In the previous edition of the ADA standard, section 4.13.9 includes this statement. Hardware required for accessible door passage shall be mounted no higher than 48 inches above finish floor. This standard did not define the low limit of hardware mounting height it only required the mounting location of 48 inches or less above the floor. This could be interpreted to mean that the hardware mounted very low would be accessible for an accessible opening, even though hardware on that location may be impossible for somewhere, someone with a wheelchair to operate. Local requirements on a closing note for this, is it's important to check your local codes for different requirements. For example, in Massachusetts, a range of accessible hardware is 36 to 48 inches AFF instead of the 34 to 48 inches that we've been talking about. And in California, operable hardware must be mounted between 34 and 48, 44 instead of the 48. The HJ should be consulted for official interpretations when necessary. Okay, moving on to threshold requirements. The 2010 ADA standards and the ICC A117.1 contain similar requirements regarding changes in level within an accessible route. When thresholds are provided in, in a door opening, the maximum allowable height is one inch, and the exception of existing or altered thresholds, which are permitted to be three quarters inch maximum in height, refer to the standards for additional criteria. These limitations on threshold height apply to manually operated and automatic doors. Um, looking at the top picture, the change in level up to a quarter inch is allowed to be vertical. The second picture shows a change in level of a quarter inch to half an inch must be beveled with a slope no greater than one to two, and finally, the third picture illustrates how changes in level greater than half an inch, a ramp with a slope no greater than one to 12 must be used, with the exception for some existing locations. All right, so we're in, entering into the fourth quadrant. Let's talk about what I'd like to call the good stuff, specifying ADA compliant hardware solutions for your project. Let's talk about lever handles and what the code has to say about them in regards to specifying ADA compliant levers. Do the codes have any requirement for lever handles specifically? There may be local jurisdictions that require return on lever handles, but it is not a requirement of the ADAG, A117.1, the IBC, or NFPA 101. However, the California Building Code requires the following. The lever of the 
the lever actuated latches or lock shall be curved to return within a half inch of the door to prevent catching on the clothing of persons during egress. This can be found in CBC 12.10.202. The standards are not prescriptive about the shape of the operable hardware, but again, it must not require tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist. So what do you need to know when specifying thumb turns? Specify a thumb turn that again, does not require tight grasping, pinching, or twisting of the wrist to operate. The required length of the thumb turn is not specified in the standards, so it's up to the code official, as usual, to determine whether the thumb turn is accessible. Look for the thumb turn that is designed so that it pivots from the end rather than the center, requiring less leverage to operate. Thumb turns which are operated with simultaneous hand or finger movements require a higher degree of dexterity and coordination and are not recommended. Let's talk about the bottom 10 clear inches that are required. Swinging doors and gate surfaces within 10 inches of the finished floor or ground measured vertically shall have a smooth surface on the push side, extending the full width of the door or gate. Parts creating horizontal or vertical joints in these surfaces shall be within 1 16th inch of the same plane as the other. Cavities created by kick plates shall be capped. There are exceptions which include sliding doors, do not have to comply with this, tempered glass doors without styles and having a bottom rail or shoe with the top leading edge tapered at 60 degrees minimum from the horizontal shall not be required to meet the 10 inch bottom smooth requirement. Doors and gates that do not extend within 10 inches of the finished floor do not have to comply and existing doors without smooth surfaces within 10 inches of the finished floor or ground shall not be required to provide the smooth surface complying with the above, though cavities created by kick plates must be capped. So one question that might come up is, on a multifamily building, are the dwelling unit doors required to have the 10 inch bottom rail smooth? Basically, the current accessibility standards require a flush, smooth area with no protruding hardware on the push side of manual doors from the floor to 10 inches up the face of the door. So the answer is a qualified yes if the door has to require has to comply with section 404 of the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design or a ICC A117.1, which would be any addition since the 90s. Whether or not the doors need to comply with these standards and this section of the standards is where the confusion can come in. Another example of a question that might come up is if you're working on a job that might have, say, embossed steel doors, the bottom rail is less than 10 inches and nothing protrudes from the door. Is it still an ADA issue? If the door is required to comply with the ADA standards and the ICC A117.1, that area of the push side of the manual door has to be flush and smooth. Recesses created by panel or vision lights are not compliant if they're within that area of the door. When specifying, keep in mind the bottom 10 inch clear width requirement can have an effect on the door elevations, the kick plates, and surface, surface bottom rods on panic devices. Okay, so when specifying a door closer, most any door closer should be able to meet ADA requirements after being properly adjusted, except for something like the door closer, in quotes, pictured on the slide. To meet code requirements, the door closer needs to be adjusted so that, again, the closing speed of the door with the door closer must be a minimum of five seconds to close from a position of 90 degrees to 12 degrees. For doors with spring hinges, not like the bungee cords pictured, the door must move from a position of 70 degrees to a closed position in 1.5 seconds minimum. After you've specified the correct hardware for the application and the hardware that will meet the code requirements, the next hurdle is to ensure that the hardware is installed at the correct heights. For recommended mounting locations of hardware, 
we recommend that you consult the SDI Steel Door Institute publication ANSI SDI A250.8, the recommended specification for standard steel doors and frames. Table 5, which is pictured, includes recommended locations for most products. Hardware not included on the table should be mounted per the manufacturer's instructions. And again, when specifying other products such as threshold, it's, remember, it's important to remember that thresholds are limited to a half inch in height with a slope no steeper than one to two. Changes in level up to a quarter inch may be vertical. Changes on level over half inch must have a ramp with a slope no steeper than one to 12. Okay, so now that we've covered most of the hardware related requirements when specifying ADA compliant openings, Let's take a minute to talk about automatic doors. Automatic doors are not specifically required by accessibility standards, but doors equipped with low energy automatic operators and power assist operators and full powered operators must meet their respective ANSI BHMA guidelines that are shown on the slide. In addition, automatic doors are required to meet some, but not all of the requirements for manual doors. There are three basic type of automatic operators for swinging doors, which would be power assist, low energy operated, and power operated, also known as full power operated. Power assist operators reduce opening force so that the door can be manually opened more easily, but they do not completely open the door without the force applied. These operators are usually activated by pushing or pulling the door, although occasionally a wall-mounted actuator is used to reduce the force only for users who need that feature. The 2007 edition of ANSI BHMA A156.19 introduces a requirement for power assist and low energy operator doors to have to be activated by a knowing act. A knowing act method may be to push, may be a push plate activator or a non-contact switch mounted on the wall or jam, an act of manually pushing or pulling the door, or an access control device like a card reader, keypad, or key switch. The standard also makes recommendations regarding the mounting location of a knowing act switch, including the following mounted within one to five feet of the door, but not more than 12 feet, accessible from the swing side when the door is open, not in a location where a user would be in the path of a moving door, mounted so that the user can see the door when activating the switch, and installed at a height of 34 inches minimum and 48 inches maximum above the floor. Oopsies. Several changes were made to the 2017 edition of the ICC A117.1, which affects automatic doors. Although this edition has not be yet been referenced by the model codes, it's important to be aware of these changes as they will impact future projects. For public entrances and vestibules, this new edition includes a paragraph which addresses public entrances and vestibules. When automatic when an automatic door or gate is required at a building or facility public entrance, it shall have a full powered automatic or low energy automatic door or gate. Um, in vestibules, when an entrance includes a vestibule, at least one exterior door or gate and one interior door or gate in the vestibule shall have the same type of automatic door or gate operator. Okay, so we've we've covered a lot of information. Yes, um, if you have any, <laughs> we've covered a lot of, a lot of information and a lot of good information. And uh, yes, I do have <clears throat> a couple people with questions here. Uh, we'll try to get through right. these as <clears throat> as quick as we can um, because I know we're running up against everybody's timelines. Um, the first one is uh, is there a is there a way that we can get a copy of these slides sent to us so our members could download them and keep them for reference? For sure, yes. Okay. I can definitely do that. Okay. Uh, and if you just want to uh, send that to me, I've got the names of the people that are interested, and then I'll just uh, forward forward it on out from there. Yeah. So that'll be great. For, uh, so for, for those of you that uh, 
or interested in getting a copy of the slides. Um, okay, there's a couple more that are. All right. And I'll write all those yeah. names down. Um, <clears throat> just uh, let's see. First question we got here. Um, in an application where uh, is, and this person's um, uh, evidently, it sounds like they're working on an R&D type project. Uh, what type of um, specifying uh, needs or or watchouts or maybe hangups that need to be uh, is, is looked out for is there, is there any any specific hardware hardware requirements as far as class and stuff for areas that might be considered like highly hazardous like maybe class one division one high hazard say research labs or something that maybe maybe they work with highly explosive chemicals in a lab or a chemistry type environment is there any any type of particular ada hardware uh, is there a specific class that needs to be specified, or is it just the general the general ADA requirements, and then the uh, designer, construction manager, whoever may be design building it, whatever, just needs to make sure that 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 area meets what it needs to meet code wise. Yeah, that's a good question. So that area should need to meet all the ADA accessibility guidelines, um, assuming that it is an accessible path, mm -hmm. and that also. Um, typically for high hazard we see the requirement to use panic hardware okay. okay so that might be looking to but it should most likely need to just meet you know the minimum of what we've discussed today okay uh, the next question we have uh, we've actually got a couple on um, door actuators or door actuators and operators so I'll just kind of combine these two um, on the door operators uh, just kind of a general experience question what what has been your experience uh, as far as which one operates more consistently or maybe with less problems uh, kind of like controlled pneumatically or electronically oh that's a good question um, I prefer something that's hardwired. Okay. Um, I don't specify a lot of them. Typically, we have them in a related section. Okay. Um, so, dig into that and see if I have some, you know, kind of experts in our office that might have a better answer. Okay. Um, on the um, on the uh, door opener buttons uh, for automatic doors, as far as their location of where it needs to be located for somebody to access it and push it, is there beyond the specific height that it needs to be? Is there is there a particular location it needs to be um, dimensionally or within reach of the person? Like. I know you don't want them having to reach behind them on a wall to operate a door that's in front of them. Is there a, a particular place that those need to be uh, installed or is it just kind of a common sense thing? Um, I think it's mainly common sense and then I did go over some of the requirements for them. So when I send out the slides, um, I can include that information in there too. Okay. I know the dimensions they need to be within you know, maximum 12 feet away from the door, things like that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that probably, probably covers that. Um, any, uh, this is a good question. Any, any specific requirements for ADA on automatic revolving doors? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I believe we just barely touched on revolving doors. Again, that's not something we would specify in my door hardware section. Okay. So let me dig into that and yeah, if they have an email address, I'd be happy to reach out. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, last question we've got here, um, a legion uh, in general, um, is there, uh, it, does your website uh, or, or manufacturers and such, uh, do you have availability to um, BIM files for things such as Revit and SketchUp and, and all that wonderful software? Um, yes, so we typically um, work with architects using Revit. Uh, is that the question? I'm yep. thinking so, right? Yep. Yeah. So okay. multiple different platforms. Yes, we have we have experience with those. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got another one here. It just popped in. Um, where there is a vestibule and two doors uh, in series that are both in sequence, uh, where the doors are on operators. Um, the vestibule has to be a certain size to meet meet the ADA, uh, but is there a good practice for putting a push button 
in the vestibule. Man, I knew somebody was going to ask about doors in the series. I can, so, I can give, you, I can give you their name, and you can, you can go yell at her at construct. <laughs> <laughs> I will lovingly try to explain, but yes, that's a whole other topic, and that's a good question. So yeah, if I can reach out to them, that'd be great. Okay, um, and then uh, actually, I think that pretty much. Yep, that fills out the list. Uh, so Leslie, um, great presentation, great information. Um, I will get you the names of the people that are interested in the, uh, uh, the slides. Um, or if you just want to send them to me, I can, I can send them out to them also. However, yeah. uh, however that works best for you. Um, so, yeah. okay, folks, uh, looks like there are no more questions and uh, we are about out of time for the day. Uh, so please be sure to fill out the survey at the end of the presentation and remember to include your AIA or USGBC credit or your, your numbers for uh, educational credits. Uh, Leslie, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your presentation and you taking the time to speak with us. And we appreciate Allegion as one of our chapter sponsors for the past several years and hopefully uh, years to come. Uh, everyone, uh, hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Be sure to join us again in September for the start of the new uh, CSI fiscal year. And for those of you that are going to construct in October in Long Beach, be sure to keep an eye out on the website for uh, the information for the annual CSI Next Chapter meet and greet at the CSI booth. And everybody have a uh, very safe and great summer. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.